Stan, it's a great pleasure to speak to you. A commonplace in US science fiction is that SF is a kind of satire or commentary on the present. Bill Gibson even says that SF is really only about the time it's written in. By contrast, Chinese science fiction seems to take SF's prophetic or predictive function much more seriously. I'm interested in why. I think mostly because uh, science fiction in China as a genre was introduced firstly from the West and later on we learned a lot from Soviet Union. So oh. actually it got a lot of like uh, idea with using science fiction to popularizing the uh, science uh, knowledge and theories. So that was the historical reason. And for now, I think we are uh, we're in between a historical moment that's shifting from a, a labor-based uh, uh, economic system towards a technology-driven and innovation-driven society. So I think people, especially the government, they got this kind of high hope on science fiction can inspire people, especially younger generation, to have them to, to create this kind of curiosity and passion on science and technology. So I think that's the uh, main reason. That's fascinating. Chinese SF seems to be going through a, a kind of a golden age at the moment, of which you are you know, very much a representative. Do you think the Chinese SF has the potential to become a international phenomenon, a cultural technology with global appeal? Yeah, because when we first think of science fiction and movies, it's always like uh, Western dominant, especially uh, America. So, but in the recent year, you can see also the uprising of Asia culture, especially Korean movies, uh, literature and art. So I think, uh, for example, the most big hit Squid Game recently on Netflix is totally a good example. So I think Chinese science fiction definitely has this create, create uh, a huge potential to be international, but we have to collaborate with international talents and platforms. So that's the, that's the case in my uh, own opinion. That's fascinating. Like many technologists, I became a technologist because of SF, and um, Chinese F SF is reminding me about why I love the genre so much in the first place. Speaking about predicting the future, you recently published AI 2041, 10 visions for our future with the former president of Google China, Kai Fu Li, now one of China's leading VCs. I'm interested, why combine forces with a computer scientist and an investor? Yeah, me and Dr. Kai Fu Li uh, have uh, had overlapping time back in the day when I worked for Google. Mm -hmm. So I think we both uh, share this kind of uh, vision that we should work together to write a book to describe a future with AI technology, but in a uh, positive and brighter way because we already have uh, so much uh, dystopian imagination on AI and robots like 2001 Space Odyssey, Terminators, as Makina, etc., etc. So I think it's the time we build up something concrete based on scientific facts and, and current development, but to give people some hope because uh, we need technology to help us to uh, confront all these kind of challenges, especially climate change. So I think that's our starting point. Well, let's get into climate change. Optimistic is the the right word. The book presents a vision of the future where AI is like electricity now, ubiquitous um, but invisible. And in one of the stories in AI 2041, Dreaming of Plentitude, you and Dr. Kai Fu Li imagine a world where carbon neutrality is a reality because of an abundance of green energy. How do you think AI can accelerate the development of more sustainable technologies? I think for now, the first priority is green uh, energy. So I mm -hmm. think AI definitely can help us to find some new material for higher cap capacity batteries. So I think that's now the very bottleneck of using uh, uh, green energy massively. 
So uh, as AlphaFold can predict the protein structure using uh, machine learning. So I think that's totally the way we can use to find some new material in the future. And also the smart grid can help us to distribute the uh, uh, green energy in a, in a more efficient way. So that's another thing I think AI can help us to reach the point of carbon neutrality. Well, you and I share a, a, a similar vision of green technology. I strongly urge the audience to buy the book and read it. It's both a treat and educational. But, but your vision, Stan, has undergone a kind of evolution. In your first novel, The Waste Tide, you were much more worried about environmental devastation, in, in particular e-waste. Which of those two futures, the waste tide or AI 2041, is more likely and why? I think it all depends on how we going to use the technology because technology creates so much like electronic waste, like devices we use, retire, they, they become uh, trash all over the world. But meanwhile, if we can uh, use the technology in the right direction, we can have this kind of in a, a revolutionary breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So that means we might find a way to cure the disease we uh, already have uh, mm -hmm. for now. So I, I think it's like uh, the, the sword were to, uh, to brace. So it's always high hope and fear. Oh, that's so true. Science may be an absolute good, but technology is good or bad, right? Depending on the the uses you put it to. At the moment, though, do you feel personally more hopeful or pessimistic about society in this year, 2021? I think in this year is kind of mixed and complicated feelings around me because as you can see, the climate change is becoming even stranger than fiction. So there's uh, flooding, there's uh, storms, there's uh, global warming everywhere. So I think we're at the very uh, dangerous status of the tipping point. So if we don't take action from now and to change our mindset, and to go beyond all these binaries and geopolitic conflicts and, and ideology, the, uh, uh, discrimination, bias, we couldn't get there. We were, we, were, we were running towards the cliff. So I think that's something concerns me the most. Yeah. I saw a recent IEA report that said 50% of the technologies we'll need to create a carbon neutral future haven't been invented yet. And though that can be somewhat, you know, frightening, the good news is that there are technological miracles, you know, every day. <laughs> um, which problem do you think doesn't currently have a solution that especially stimulates your concerns and your interests? Yeah, I, I can think of several big concerns. The first one is like uh, electricity storage technology, which is not ready there. The battery right now is too expensive. And, and even like they are uh, uh, damaging the environment worse, right? So, so that's one bottleneck. And the second one is how to deal with all this uh, plastic waste we create uh, over the previous decades is everywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. So how to deal with all those trash? So I think that's the second. And I think the third is uh, if we try to reach the point of carbon neutrality, we need to capture the CO2 directly from the air. But all I can read from the papers, it all say it's kind of impossible to go in the cost effective way. So I think there's, uh, I'm not sure if there's any team, any startup is doing uh, investment and, and, and RD on, on, on this area. So I think this top three priority is on, in my concern. I worry a great deal about biodiversity. Also, we live on, you know, spaceship Earth, a, uh, an ecology, uh, and I fear we're destroying the biodiversity that makes life possible. 
true because I revisit uh, the uh, James Lovelock. Mm -hmm. He's the one who created the term Gaia hypothesis. So I think right now is from a hypothesis into a theory which everyone is taking uh, considering seriously because all we can see is actually happening. So we are just one species among the all. So if we couldn't get rid of our arrogance as human mm -hmm. being and to coexist in a harmonious way. So I think there's no way out because you couldn't think it in a holistic way, like Gaia, like the whole earth, like all this animals, plants, fungi, microbe, were actually deeply connected with each other. So uh, one species extinction will totally affect the rest of us. So if human beings couldn't shift their mindset and and level up our awareness of the issue, I think there's no easy way out. I couldn't agree more. We need a humility uh, about our connectedness uh, in upon Gaia. You, you asked whether or not um, startups and universities were actually embarking upon the, the research that would produce solutions. I know that most of the transformative innovations of the last 50 years have come out of universities and been commercialized by venture-backed startups. Do you have a message for the SOSV audience about the kinds of problems they should be working on and the urgency? which they should bring to those problems? Yeah, I, I, I'm actually looking to a lot of different uh, areas of technologies. So I think maybe in, in my scientific, uh, science fictional uh, crazy imagination, I think in the future, maybe uh, a combination of uh, biology, like a uh, 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 things as uh, biology and uh, and cybernetics, uh, electronic uh, 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 science, I think might be a direction like uh, how we can doing this engineering, uh, re re uh, re editing the genes of microbe to mm -hmm. have them working for us to uh, uh, to 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 digest the plastic waste maybe in a way and how they can transform the current battery uh, maybe in the future because in my book waste high i create a kind of like imagination like using virus together with the battery so it's more like uh, with higher capacity and, and it's more efficient so i think in the future maybe we need to do this kind of cyborg kish uh, thinking and and, and uh, experiments to pushing uh, to push mm. things forward because I I believe I totally believe the answers, the solutions is in the nature. So mm. is our teacher is our mentor. So we have to looking for the answers uh, back to the nature rather than like create by our own. Nature is the best teacher. Let me conclude on a personal note. I'm very interested by where you find your inspiration from scientific papers, from startups, from watching the news. Where? Yeah, besides uh, all the stuff you just mentioned, I think some other stuff like dreaming, like traveling, like the person you encounter in your daily life. So, and, and also there's some... Um, I don't know, it's like some spiritual moment when you're doing meditation. So all these things can give me a lot of inspiration. So it's from everywhere. Fascinating. Are you working on another book? Yeah, actually, I'm close to uh, wrap up. I, my, my next book is for kids on carbon neutrality. So it's quite relevant to our topic today. I can't wait to read and have my own my own children read it too. Stan, thank you very much. That was that was a treat. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much, Jason.